Uh, our speaker this morning is uh, uh, a, a godly and feisty woman of God, uh, a dear friend of mine. Uh, Kelly Soy, for, uh, for years, uh, was the youth pastor at the Santa Barbara Community Church, where I go. And uh, it, I, I say this without exaggeration. It was the best doggone youth ministry I'd ever seen uh, uh, in terms of depth and, and breadth and everything else. She just did a fabulous job and became a good friend along the way. I, uh, I love Kelly. Uh, she is feisty. She's got a real razor sharp wit and I love to talk smack with her and just kind of go back and forth. But she is a sister in Christ and right now she is serving as the uh, director of leadership development and recruitment for the uh, Free Methodist Church of California, and, uh, and I know she's doing a great job, but I'm just so glad we could get her back to speak here in chapel, and uh, Kelly, we welcome you back in the name of Christ. Let's give her a Westmont welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. I consider feisty a compliment. I don't know about you guys, but like a little fuego in my life. There will be some of you, welcome back from spring break. And I know that you've been traveling a lot and I want the lights up so you'll stay awake, please. And there will be some people that maybe choose to skip. And if they do, tell, they'll say, who, who was in chapel today? Were there any good? And just say yes. And um, say, and who was it? And there was this lady with the last name Soifer, okay? It's like surfer with a Brooklyn accent, okay? <laughs> Soifa. My dad is Jewish, and that's the way we say it. When I was in college, some people pronounced it soife, and um, that doesn't work, okay? <laughs> Just FYI. Um, so I have a good friend, David Goss, and David is a pastor for the Free Methodist Church in Goleta, and I love him dearly, and I love him especially because I've known him since he was a freshman in high school when he was in one of my uh, Young Life clubs, and uh, he was different then. And, uh, but David and I meet regularly, and we talk about ministry and how to, how, what it means to lead a church, and he, help, he asks me sometimes for input and feedback, and sometimes I push a little bit, and I ask him questions. I suppose I get a little feisty. And uh, sometimes he'll say, Kelly, you're getting in my kitchen. You're getting in my kitchen. And I'm pushing a little bit. You know, maybe I'm getting like up in his grill or, you know, whatever. I don't know all of them, the terms, but I'm, I don't mean to, but I'm, I'm invading his space a little bit. So that might happen today. That's not my intent. I don't come up here to try to come up with something that will just kind of push some buttons. But if God has this message for you, perhaps. So before I do that, I don't feel like I have any right to walk in and just talk at you, I want to invite you to sit and pull back a chair and sit in my kitchen for a little bit, just a couple minutes. Don't worry, I'm not going to dump all my problems on you. Um, but I just want you to get to know me and kind of where I'm coming from a little bit, okay? So I may look backwards a couple times. Uh, come on, these buttons, right, Ben? Like that? Ah, oh, there we go. Okay, that's me. Um, now, as Ben said, I've been in youth ministry, and it's actually been for 30 years, and sometimes when I show that photo to students, they look at like a, kind of like a yellow lab, you know, they're just kind of like, what is that? And what I figured out is that they're baffled by a black and white photo, <laughs> which makes me so sad. Okay, so I only got better looking. Um, now, I was down at the Pagan University down the road, UC Santa Barbara. <laughs> And um, that's me writing a paper. I was an English major, and as I said, my dad is Jewish. He never practiced, but I had an Aunt Rose and Uncle Eddie, and they were always taking pictures of me while I was studying. And so that's a look on, if you don't stop taking photos, I'm going to shove it down your throat picture. So that's me. Uh, but then two years later, I was at Young Life. I worked for Young Life. And I uh, was a work crew boss. And that's with my first group of students at the camp. And I have two words for you. Yeah, that's a home perm. I don't know what, what, what that is, because my hair is straight as a board, so I have no recollection of the 80s. Um, that's me uh, chaperoning a dance in 1987. Yeah, okay. And that's me, and that's me uh, working at a camp, and I have two more words for you. 
Yes, okay, so, <laughs> wow, that's all I have to say. Wow, okay, so. <laughs> then in the 90s, I went to Malibu. I don't know if some of you have been there. I've seen Malibu sweatshirts around campus sometimes. My joke is uh, it's in British Columbia and it's where God lives. Uh, it's the most gorgeous place. But my favorite part about this photo is who's that? Does anyone know? That's Dr. Scott Anderson, who uh, teaches art here at uh, Westmont College. And I knew him as Scotty, the 90-pound uh, water polo playing freshman <laughs> that was in my Young Life Club. And you can't really see from the photo, but he has some very chlorine-damaged hair. It's like straight up. It's total 90s kind of mod. It was great. So that's Dr. Anderson. Uh, then I moved, I moved from traditional Young Life Club. Uh, we realized that at least 50% of the students in Santa Barbara are not being reached by our Young Life Clubs. So I changed our approach and we uh, worked on the east side and that's the glowing white lady in the front there and um, with our group of students. And then uh, I, moved, I transitioned. I was a member at Santa Barbara Community Church and they invited me to start the youth ministry. We only had about 300 people at the church then and they gave me all of three junior high boys to get started with. So that's our group about five years later. Uh, we're at camp. Why I have my hand under my chin? I have n it looks like a bad Sears photo, you know? I don't know what's going on. And then, um, of course, you know, because of that, I went to Forest Home. <laughs> all for Jesus. That's all I have to say. The mud bowl. Ugh. Okay, so. What that adds up to is many, many graduations. 13 years with Young Life, 15 years with the youth ministry, and then three years teaching at Providence Hall Christian High School. So it's been a great uh, road, and I've gotten to, like I said, a lot of graduations. Oh, who's that? Oh. Um, you might not recognize. That's Casey. He has a, a mustache that should not be right now. So... Um, dude kill that thing, okay? That's all I have to say. Um, and that's with uh, a couple students that are now freshmen that I had at Providence. So, And then I have the rest of my life. Uh, I am a, a proud aunt. That's my niece and nephew who are now 11 and 14. So now I actually know how to talk to them because I only know how to talk to youth. Um, and that's me and my scooter. You'll see me around campus. Um, I sold my car a year and a half ago. And I'm Kelly Green, okay? So that's my scoot, and then I also have a bike. And um, this is me and my best friend Ruth, and we're meeting Rick Warren. Uh, we met him at the U2 concert at the Rose Bowl. So I love that I didn't meet him at a pastor's conference. So um, it was great. He hugged me, and he goes, just think, four minutes ago I hugged Bono. <laughs> huh. Yeah, so I don't know. So there you have it. So you've been in my kitchen a little bit, and some of you will end up being right where I am. You'll be speaking in front of people, and you will face the same quandary that I have, and that is, God, what do you want me to say? What, what would be good for them to hear right now? But all I could do was think about, in these 30 years of youth ministry, that's also been 30 years of conversations with Westmont students, because I've either had former students up here, or I've... Uh, worked with you as leaders in the youth ministry. And our questions tend to revolve, the same top, revolve around the same topic. And that is kind of, what do I want to be when I grow up? You know, what do I want to do with my life? What's God's call on my life? What was I built for? And I never tire of that conversation, should any of you want to have it. I love listening, and I love processing that. But as those years have unfolded, I've also um, sort of had a fun little joke with Westmont students, and if anyone's heard me speak uh, before, I've probably said this, but forgive me, I don't want to hurt you, but I, I joke with Westmont students that you sort of have this um, Indiana Jones for Jesus complex here at the school. You, you know, you kind of have this, what am I going to do, and you can almost hear that, you know, and you want to kind of just, you know, scale every mountain and, and conquer the world, and you feel... Whether it's appropriate or not, I think there's this subtle pressure that you might think you need to start a nonprofit or be the president of a small country or something <laughs> extraordinary. And because you've been exposed to so many great people here in chapel or through your professors or, pe or alumni that you've heard about, 
And I don't mean to disparage them because I actually know some of those people. I mean, maybe not the president of a small country, but I do know people that have started nonprofits and gone on and got, <clears throat> excuse me, gotten multiple degrees. And those are really great and impressive people, and I'm glad I know them. But, you know, my question is basically what about the rest of us? What is God calling us to do? Are we all called to be extraordinary? And you hear a lot of those extraordinary things, and I don't want to argue with any of that. I don't want to debate it. I don't want to disagree with it. There's a lot of great things that could be said about serving Christ in that way. But I just want to offer another perspective, another idea. That's all I'm offering today, is another perspective, another idea. And what it is is this. What if, when you grow up, when you move on from here, what if you prayed about it, moved somewhere, and just lived there the rest of your life? What if you just sought to be the presence of Christ in a consistent, persistent, faithful, perhaps feisty way? Just think about it, chew on it for these next few minutes. Now, I want to tell you that I haven't just fallen off the turnip truck, okay? I haven't been living in a cave. I've been hearing it all that what you're going to get told, that you're going to have to change your career several times, that the average graduate is going to be living abroad at some point, that, you know, the world is a global village, that we're all connected. And that, so I understand all that. You know, I'm on Facebook, so I, I, I get that. But as Christians, we're called to be in the world... But we're also called to be not of the world and be countercultural. And in this world of frantic movement, what if we stayed in one place? What if you stayed in one place the rest of your life and lived in a community that radiated Christ's love? So I have a slide for us to think about. In pragmatic America, we are often enamored of and motivated by pragmatism rather than simple obedience to Jesus. We are too often tempted to justify our existence on this planet by doing something significant, by making a difference in the world so that we can go to bed at night feeling good about ourselves. But the Christian message is about a God who judges and loves us in our insignificance. That is, when our self-centeredness has sabotaged our ability to make any fundamentally sound contribution to our lives or to others. This God speaks to us the frank word that not only do we not make a difference in the world, day to day, we threaten to make the world worse by our sin. Aren't you glad I came? But in Jesus Christ, he has judged and forgiven us through the cross. And now he uses even our insignificant efforts to witness to his coming work in Jesus Christ. Now, I haven't traveled all over the world. I'm not going to dazzle you with the places I've been on my Facebook page or anything like that. But I have traveled. I spoke at uh, Faith Academy in the Philippines last year. I've traveled through Turkey. I've been through most countries in Europe. I've been through a lot of Central America. And I added it up in preparing this message. I've been to 32 of the 50 states. Okay? So I have traveled. And I have found something interesting. In the United States, when I travel, the first question is always, what's your name? Right? The second question invariably is, what do you do? And that's that subtle, pragmatic question that we tend to have as Americans. What do you do, i.e., <clears throat> what's your education? What's your socioeconomic level? We find our identity in our jobs, in our roles. But as I've traveled around the country, I'm thinking about a village on a volcanic hillside in Guatemala named Santa Maria de Jesus. And, or I think about a little village I went on vacation in Cinque Terre in Italy. When I met people there, what's your name? Como te llamas? The second question, where are you from? See, the rest of the world cares about that more. 
where are you from? Now, they're not asking what, what's the GPS coordinates that you're from, the geographic location. They're not asking that. I mean, I could tell you I was born in Long Beach, California. But I, I only lived there for two and a half years. That's not where I'm from. Where I'm from is where my people are from, where my community is from, where I've lived. And if we're all over the place to acquire all these experiences and all these travels, can you say where you're from if that happens? I think that's a difficult question. I think we want the goodies that come with long-term relationships, long-term commitment. We want the authenticity that comes from that, the depth of relationship. But we don't, I don't know if we want to work for it. I, I want to show you something that maybe helps illustrate that point a little bit. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know if you've seen that before, but basically the, the Swedish at the end or Finnish or whatever it is, it says, some people are lucky in life, but for the rest of us, saving can be smart. <laughs> Get it? Subconsciously, I think most of us want to have something just drop out of the sky. To have it all put together and have these magic relationships and, and love and meaning and purpose and have it just drop in our laps. But let's be honest. I want to break it to you. It takes time to develop that. And saving can be smart. In other words, spend your time working toward that. If you want to think about this topic at all outside of this message, the book that I would encourage you to pick up first would be called The Wisdom of Stability. It's by my friend Jonathan Wilson Hartgrove. He came here in the fall during Global Focus Week. Uh, he married a, a student from our youth group, and I helped perform their ceremony. Pretty excited about that. It's called The Wisdom of Stability, Rooting Faith in a Mobile Culture. And I just want to read you one paragraph. He says that we find stability we were made for as we come home to life with God in community with other people. This is our true home, but settling in isn't easy. Will told me the story of relocating his family to be part of a church that takes community seriously. After a year in the new location, he met with one of his pastors to talk about how things were going. Life was good, Will reflected, and he was grateful for the welcome that he and his family had received at the new church. But he wasn't sure that he was experiencing the community that he'd expected. Frankly, Will had hoped for more. The pastor listened to his misgivings and then asked how long Will and his family had been there. About a year, he replied. Then I guess you've got about a year's worth of community, the pastor said matter-of-factly. Stay another year and you'll have two years' worth. Stay 30 and you might find something of what you're looking for. Now I know there's a lot of conversation, I'm told, up here at Westmont about community. And there may be some eye rolling as I use that word. I'm not really talking about community like that, I don't think, as much as I understand. That's community for you, and it's important. I'm talking about you living in a community in order to give and to live it out. I love the image of this book. On the front, it shows a tree and the root structure it takes is as deep below the ground as above. To, to dig those roots, to dig down deep, takes time. But it's worth it. Another book I'm reading uh, that's totally jerking my chain, frankly, Movements That Change the World. And it's about learning what God is doing in the rest of the world to move the kingdom forward. And it challenges kind of our United States missionary models that we've been using. And it's by a guy named Steve Addison. And he, he says, what I would completely agree with, that we're all missionaries. Absolutely. Missionaries establish contact. This is what they do, right? They establish contact with non-Christians, whom I call the unconvinced. They proclaim the news of Jesus, the Messiah and Savior, which includes proclamation, preaching, teaching, and instruction. They lead people to faith in Jesus Christ and conversion and baptism, and they integrate the new believers into the local community of the followers of Jesus through the Lord's Supper, transformation of social and moral behavior, and charity. It 
If we're all called to reflect Christ through contact, proclamation, bringing people to the faith, and then integrating them, we need to take the time to do that. It doesn't happen in six weeks. Sometimes it can happen in six years. And when you get around 25 or 30 years, it starts taking hold. All those photos I showed you at the beginning, they were all taken when I lived in Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara has been my pivot foot. It's been the place that I've anchored. Now, I know that some of you might say, well, a rough life, you were called to Santa Barbara. But, you know, it's not like, it's not like I'm, you know, laying out and <laughs> surfing. Um, although those things aren't bad. Okay. But that, that's not what I'm doing. I, I did not plan on ending up here. But this is where God put me. And I've been grateful. As I shared at the beginning, I've seen students, former students, become pastors. It's been really fun to see what's happened with Scott as he's become a, a tenure track professor at Westmont. But I've also had former students go to prison. I've had former students take their lives. I've had students get married, have babies, get divorced, become addicts, become addicted to pornography, gambling, drugs, alcohol. That's life. And walking through time with people can be powerful. I'm grateful in God's grace that as through the weirdness of the internet and Facebook and all that, people find me after all these years and they still find me at my post. I'm still doing what God asked me to do. And we start the conversations again. I think I've experienced more through staying in one place, these nine words. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We're called to be Jesus. Philippians 2.5, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, it says. And as imperfectly as we are, we can as people, what would it mean to live this out? To be the same yesterday, today, and forever in a place. That's all I'm asking you to think about. I'm not saying I'm right and everyone else is wrong. Just consider it. Now, at a nice place, Christian place like Westmont, I'm assuming that you've heard uh, the story of the Samaritan woman in John 4. Just nod your heads. Thank you. Feels like I'm leading youth group. <laughs> um, we know it. It's an amazing story that I can't spend enough time on. In fact, um, I'm teaching a May term course. I would still love people to sign up on internships. I've got all these incredible internships, and I want people to take advantage of them. But I have to train you first, and I will be spending time on this chapter. Jesus broke through so many social barriers and limitations in this. We all know Samaritans and Jews didn't hang out. Jews considered Samaritans unclean. They didn't want to have anything to do with them. And even though to get from the south to the north required going through Samaria, they would all go around. But not Jesus. He went straight through, breaking through barrier number one. He went to the well in the heat of the day, which was crazy. In the desert, you don't go to a well in the heat of the day when it's so hot. But that's where he went, barrier number two. And there was a woman there who was avoiding everyone else, who didn't want to see anyone. And Jesus talked to her, breaking through barrier number three. Jewish men did not talk to any women they were not related to. And then barrier number four, he talked to her of spiritual things. They had a conversation, and very gently, it's revealed that she's been married five times and is living with a sixth man. And what unfolds from there is to me one of the delights of the gospel. Some scholars call her the first evangelist. Because you know what she did? Verse 38, I'm sorry, 39. 
Many of the Samaritans who came out of that town believed in him, how? Through the woman's testimony. And this is what she said, this simple sentence. He told me everything I've ever done. He told me everything I've ever done. And she felt safe again. He saved her. But he didn't just save her spiritually. He saved her socially. He, was, he sent her back into her community that she'd felt rejected by. To be like Jesus, we're not going to know in the heat of an instant that someone's been married five times and living with a six. Occasionally God gives us a word. But most of the time it just takes time to know that. Do you see what I'm saying? To build the trust, to build the credibility, to have the depth of relationship. What if the most countercultural thing you did with your life was to love a community well? It's like fine wine. So think about staying at the kitchen kitchen table and sitting with others so that when people ask you, where are you from, you have something to say. Or put another way, kind of a Facebook language, rather than the places I've been, you would create an app that just says, the place I am. And know everything about it. Allow me to pray for you. Jesus, thank you so much for each student here. Thank you for the ministry of Westmont, that they have a a feast that they probably aren't even aware of how great it is, of what they get to hear and receive here. I pray for life. These next six weeks before school gets out will be so full. And it'll be tempting just to let their schedules run their lives. How I pray that they will sit and listen for your still small voice. And rather than, Lord, impose demands on you, I pray that they would sit and listen and be able to hear what you are building in their souls for them to do. I pray for conversations to come out of this. I thank you that you are Lord. In your name we pray, amen. Have a glorious day.